Well, good morning, everyone. This is Larry Welch again, coming to you from the Texas Asphalt Pavement Association in Buda, Texas. Uh, lovely weather around here today, raining and cloudy and kind of foggy. I hope where you are is nice. If it's not, be safe out there. Uh, a couple of things before we get started in the presentation. Uh, remember, we do record these webinars, and we have them on our webinar library at our website. Uh, our website's got a lot of great information. If you go to the TechSapple website, you can look up texasasphalt.org. Up at the top right corner, there's a go to work videos. If you'll click on that, you can go look at some of our new uh, the specification changes that TechSpot is doing. Uh, Chuck Fuller and Ryan Barbarak have recorded those about the two special specs. Uh, you can see that on the left side in the menu bar. You can click on specification and look at those videos to give you updates. Um, there's a lot of other information. Again, if you click on education, you can see that right there it says asphalt webinars. Uh, you can go to that. You can view our library, go back and visit any of the webinars and review those again uh, just to help you out. Also, there's safety shares there, there's technical talk, all kinds of information on the Texas Asphalt Pavement Association website. We also want to remind you about our MAPS MAPS conference. It's coming up February 12th to the 13th at the Embassy Suites Hotel Conference Center in San Marcos, Texas. If you will go to uh, there on the first page, it says calendar events. We'll scroll down, it will show you the MAPS conference, and you can go register online for that. Again, that's February 12th and 13th. Uh, but go ahead and try to register for that early and get in on that. If you need a hotel, there's several around there. We do have some rooms blocked off there at the Embassy Suites. We'd love for you to be a part of our. First annual was last year in February up in Grapevine, Texas. Just a very good, successful uh, two-day conference. A lot of great speakers. So come and join us about that. Uh, next month, we will have our uh, part two of this uh, liquid asphalt, if you will, and all of them modified asphalt binders. This is part one. But next month in December on the 19th, 10 a.m., our regular time, we will have part two. And y'all are in for a real treat today. We have Gary Pip. Gary, just so glad to have you today on our webinar. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, if you wish, I'll go ahead and get started. Go ahead. Well, I'm going to let Gary introduce himself and uh, who he works for, and then he's going to just carry on the process. Uh, one thing before I, I keep going, if you want to type in uh, on the chat box, a question. Uh, we will, uh, I will look for those questions and I'll bring them up during the presentation or we'll talk about them at the end. But just type those in the chat box. Uh, and we have 75 attendees today. This is a great webinar. Really appreciate it. So, Gary, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take off with of it. All right. Thank you very much, Larry, and good morning, everyone. Uh, fortunately for me, I guess fortunately for me, is that I'm up in the Dallas area right now and it's bright sunshine. And unfortunately, outside the room, there's some people doing landscaping and leaf blowers and all that stuff. So if you hear any background noise, that should dissipate soon. It's not so bad now, but it, it was a bad a little bit earlier. At any rate, my name is Gary Fitz, and I uh, am a market development manager for Craton Polymers, uh, which is uh, based in Houston, corporate headquarters and center there are, are there in Houston. Uh, I live just outside San Antonio and work from a remote home office. Uh, my background is I am a civil engineer uh, registered in Texas uh, since 1986. I've worked with the Texas DOT or State Department of Highways and Public Transportation back in the 80s uh, in the San Antonio district uh, for Mr. Stotzer. Uh, a lot of my work was on the downtown Y projects at that time. Uh, after that I've done work with consulting and pavement consulting engineering companies uh, most of my time, though, was with the Asphalt Institute as a regional engineer based out of San Antonio for Texas and some surrounding states. And then uh, I was a technology application specialist for uh, Shell, uh, providing technical services for Shell when Shell had their asphalt business along the U.S. Gulf Coast. Uh, I've been with Craton since uh, the first of the year. 
a little history about Craton is they actually uh, came out of Shell Chemical. Uh, Craton was involved with develop, initially developing SBS polymers back in the middle of the 20th century uh, as part of Shell Chemical. And then uh, it was spun off of Shell Chemical right around the turn of the century. And so uh, uh, interestingly enough, when you've been around like me as, as for a while, uh, the people I work with now, I actually knew them when they were working for Shell back then. Uh, at any rate, enough of that. What you see here on this first slide there are a couple of pictures, and uh, they don't have a whole lot of relevance. Now. I'm going to come back to these towards the end of the presentation as we introduce kind of where the future is with respect to polymer modified binders. But as we get started here, what I'm going to do is start from the beginning and introduce asphalt binders, uh, provide some definitions. Uh, describe very briefly and very generically production of asphalt binders and some specifications for them. We'll move forward into modified binders and talk about those, and then ultimately on the performance and what distinguishes the performance of polymer modified binders uh, to those that are not modified. Benjamin, which is uh, having worked for Shell Benjamin, uh, is, the, is the most prevalent English word used to describe asphalt binders around the world uh, outside of the United States, is defined by ASTM D8. One thing when you look at ASTM designations is the smaller the number, the older it is. And so D8 is one of the oldest designations they have. And you can just see how, how asphalt binders or asphalt cement is defined find there. Uh, there's a, a variety of terms as I've already used thus far for these things. What I'm going to stick with or try to stick with is asphalt binder as we go on to since that seems to be the most accepted term uh, in the United States and North America for that. The primary uses of asphalt binders are to glue aggregates together or to seal or waterproof surfaces or other materials and probably over 99 percent uh, of that combined is used for paving and roof paving and roofing applications. Uh, some asphalt binder goes into making cosmetics and some things like that. But most of what we see for asphalt binders goes into paving and roofing. Uh, asphalt binders are produced by refining petroleum these days. There are natural sources of it. Uh, the Trinidad Lake deposit was one of the early sources uh, in the Caribbean that was used and exported around as a binder for gluing aggregates together to make mixtures. Uh, asphalt is also uh, found, or asphalt binders are found naturally uh, in limestone rock asphalt out around the valley. Uh, and there are several producers that use that material. And they'll take a soft material to flux that to try and activate that, allow it to be used as a binder. According to the Energy Information Administration, there are four refineries currently producing asphalt. Uh, and we see uh, here on the right, you can see the over the last 10 years or so that the the amount of imports in terms of finished asphalt binders imported from outside the United States has about doubled since 2010 to up to around 10 percent. Obviously, that's going to be more of the case uh, on the coast and maybe up on the Canadian border, uh, but that's something that we see due to a variety of reasons that I'm not going to try to explain here. I could spend the rest of the time talking about that. Uh, it's just important to know and suffice to say this is becoming a more important source for or imported materials are becoming a more important source in the United States and in Texas. Uh, as far as refining goes, what you're doing to produce asphalt binders is you are distilling the petroleum, which is a blend of a variety of hydrocarbons. What doesn't boil off, what's left behind after an atmospheric distillation goes to vacuum distillation where, uh, a, uh, where a vacuum is applied to the tower that reduces the temperature that you have to run in order to be able to separate out more material. What's left behind after that is referred to by refiners as short residue or vacuum power bottoms, but that can be used for a variety of things. One of them is to be processed to make asphalt binders, a blending stock for making asphalt binders. As far as what happens in refinery and what the, the output is, uh, what you make or really depends entirely upon the raw materials going in, and that is the, the crude oils that are going into refining. This figure off on the right was from the um, Energy Information Administration, and what you can see is where different types of crude oils grade out. The heavier the crude is, the more likely someone's going to be able to, is going to be able to produce asphalt binder from it. In fact, you, you have to have a, a heavy crude in order to make some asphalt. The lower the API, or the gravity, as it's called, of the oil, 
the heavier the crude is. And so the ones on the far left would be the ones that you would typically see used maybe as the stock for making uh, one of the blend sources for making uh, asphalt at an asphalt binders at a refinery. Those on the right are less valuable for that. And just out of curiosity or out of interest here, you see where some of the more recent types of materials come into play, such as the Eagle Ford materials, uh, backing and so on. Those are very light, very sweet crudes. And so they really don't have very much residue left behind that can be used for making asphalt. Now here in the United States, I mentioned about asphalt binder usage uh, and about 85% is used for making, for paving applications with most of that going into binders used for hot mix. Of the remainder, most of that goes into roofing flux, that is to roofing companies for making shingles or for doing built roofing applications. We're gonna focus here on hot mix binder and not really talk about the other ones as we go through the remainder of the presentation. Now, just to talk about supplies of asphalt binders and that sort of thing, uh, the Texas DOT has uh, implemented some criteria for suppliers that they have in order to be pre-qualified rules as far as monitoring they must do and about shipping and, and all of these sort of things to assure that they're getting what was being specified. And this was just recently revised. I like to point to that just so the people are aware that there are, are distinct quality requirements that are set upon the suppliers for being able to be qualified for supplying these materials for textile uses. And that's something that you can readily look up on their website. And in fact, here I have an outline here that shows where you can find a list of uh, of pre-approved uh, asphalt binder suppliers. I believe there are 19 companies and 39 separate locations that are already approved, that are pre-approved for supplying asphalt binders for use in hot mix for Texas. Not all of those are in, state, are in Texas or surrounding states for that. Now the grading systems for asphalt binders uh, have evolved over the years. The very first one was, I, I've heard about it, at least, I didn't actually do this myself, but it was the chew test where someone would take a stick of asphalt binder and chew it up and determine the consistency from there. Now, obviously the temperatures are going to be pretty controlled for that unless someone was running a terrible fever. But so you had some means of being able to, to determine the resistance to flow or just the, the stiffness of the material that way. Clearly that wasn't something that was gonna last very long. And so that evolved into penetration grades, which is another ASTM designation that came upon very early, I believe that's D5. And what that did is take a standard seat, uh, Singer sewing needle and use that to penetrate for five seconds with a 100 gram weight. And the amount that it penetrated at room temperature was the way that asphalt binders were graded for a long time and continued to be graded around the world in many of the other countries. Viscosity grades came on after that in most of the United States, and those were primarily based on the viscosity of the original asphalt, that is that material that hasn't been aged. And that's analogous, I guess you could say, to motor oil gratings because it's based upon the resistance to flow at a reference temperature, in this case, 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, the Strategic Highway Research Program came along, or SHARP, and one of the technical research areas on that was for asphalt. And they spent about $50 million over five years to evaluate asphalt and, and developed a specification which was uh, referred to as a performance grade specification or PG asphalt binder spec, which we have been using now for over 20 years now in Texas. The ASHTO specification for that is designated as M320. And what you'll see looking around the country is that uh, most states are, are based, the most specs are based off of the ASHTO M320. Uh, there's often and almost always some variation that's given in there in terms of additional tests or additional criteria added to it. But M320 provides the basis for most of the specs used around the country. Now, at the bottom, what you see there is M332, which is similar to 320, but has some different uh, uses of some of the of the, some of the same tests that are used in M3, in M320, and is being developed to replace M320. And I'll have a graphic coming up in just a moment that shows you the extent of that thus far. At any rate, uh, what the PG specification does, as opposed to the previous versions, is instead of basing things on a reference temperature, like for penetrate, well, for the chew test, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, for penetration. 77 Fahrenheit, which is around room temperature or 25 degrees C, 
and for viscosity 60 degrees Celsius or 140 Fahrenheit. What this does is it tests the asphalt binder at temperatures that are analogous to temperatures in the field and the criteria have to be those which are related to performance in terms of resistance to rutting, uh, low temperature cracking and fatigue cracking in the field. Uh, also, you have conditioning methods that replicate plant mixing, which is the rolling thin film oven test, and then the uh, pressure aging vessel test or PAV test is to simulate exposure in the field for a number of years before doing the low temperature and the uh, fatigue cracking tests. When you see a number like 64 minus 42, what that tells you is that's the range of pavement temperatures over which a binder is expected to perform adequately. That is, it should be able to resist rutting and should be able to resist fatigue cracking over that range of temperatures for typical highway applications in terms of moving traffic and that sort of thing. Those numbers, by the way, are uh, temperatures in degrees Celsius. 64 is about 140 Fahrenheit and minus 22 is close to minus 8 Fahrenheit. The physical properties that are tested, instead of uh, pushing stuff through a tube and timing it or letting it flow through a tube or sticking a needle in it, what you're doing these days is you're doing something which is a, I like to say is analogous to like a, a high-tech heel test or a power steering turn test, steering turn test to where you're applying a shear load, but you're monitoring the response, and then you're taking the response to that load along with the amount of load applied, and you're able to determine characteristics from that that are uh, real logical characteristics or flow-based characteristics that can be related to pavement performance. Uh, the dynamic shear rheometer is that test, and that's sort of the backbone of this system. Uh, the test that's used for low temperature cracking is the bending beam rheometer and uh, many, many other types of materials use beam fatigue or beam testing in order to characterize properties. And simply what this is doing is at low temperatures is you're providing a, a, a load in, a, in the middle to a simply loaded beam and you're measuring the amount of deformation as that load is applied and using what comes from that as a means of characterizing the properties of the material. The rolling thin film oven on the lower left and pressure aging vessel, as I mentioned before, are there to age the binders to simulate conditions that take place in the field after plant mixing and then after aging. This is the Texas DOT current specification out of item 300, table 17, and you can see a suite of different grades uh, ranging from PG58 to PG82, and then low temperature grades going from minus 16 to minus 34. Uh, you, I was referring to 64 minus 22 before, and so you can follow that along in there, and that would be right here if you can see the cursor by just going right down through there to see the qualities. What this does is define testing temperatures, and the criteria that I mentioned before are over here. Now, one thing to point out on this is uh, this is something that's added to that that's different than ASHTO M320 that I have in circled here. And with this is an elastic recovery test, which uh, is kind of leading into what I'm going to be talking about as we go on, and that's polymer modification. Uh, you can't really comply or the binder can't comply with this result unless you're using some sort of modification to provide those elastic qualities uh, that, uh, exemplified by this test. Some other text out requirements as per the specification uh, that have been recently applied are, are shown here. And probably the two things key on this are down at or near the bottom, which is the binder quality program that I mentioned before. And then down below that is some restrictions in terms of some, some modifiers that have been used in the past uh, for producing uh, uh, PG asphalt binders. What might be coming down the road, uh, there's research taking place by TxDOT and by some of the uh, academic institutions in the state to look at asphalt binders that are being used in Texas and try to relate some of these other parameters back to performance. Uh, the Delta TC criterion is something that now exists in one of the TxDOT mix specifications, which is noted here on the slide. And what this is doing is it's, trying, it's looking at a parameter on the low temperature side to see which is controlling the most, and that is the stiffness of the binder or the uh, change or the relaxation of the stiffness of that binder as it's being loaded at low temperatures. That difference in critical temperature has been associated with premature cracking. And so what they're trying to do is to limit that difference in particular where the uh, 
or the relaxation controls to a given amount so that you don't have that issue come up. Uh, the multiple stress pre-recovery -re -pre test or MSCR is the, probably the basis of the ASHTO M332 specification I mentioned before. It uses the dynamic shear rheometer, so there's no change in equipment, but it changes the, the procedure slightly in order to determine some different factors that are used that are better predictors with respect to running in particular. Uh, another thing that comes out of that test is a percent recovery, where you're able to see how much elasticity that you have in the material. And that is something that in many states is being used to replace the elastic recovery that I mentioned in the slide that showed the specification with this, because this takes much less time to run. There's much less variability in it. It's just an easier and more indicative test to run that looks at the uh, effectiveness of modification on the asphalt binder. I mentioned ASHTO M332 a couple of times, and this slide that comes from the Asphalt Institute website uh, kind of shows the trends and things uh, as of a couple of months ago. I can tell you this, that there are some of these are gonna start, what you see in blue here, in dark blue are states that have adopted M332 across the board. What you see in light blue is states that have adopted part of it. And in those cases, it's mostly the, the MSCR recovery that I mentioned before, as opposed to the recovery. Here in Texas, that is being looked at, but it hasn't been adopted yet. But you can see that it's already there in some surrounding states in Louisiana and Oklahoma. And I can tell you from my experience right now that you're going to see that in at least one of the binder grades in Georgia coming up next year when they publish their new standard specification. Uh, in uh, Alaska, they're using that for the grade that's currently used in the Anchorage area uh, when they're paving uh, roadway surfaces there. So we see a, a trend for this to increase either partially or, or completely. And uh, I, from my opinion on this is that this is beneficial to the industry. I can tell you this, having worked for a binder supplier and we had a laboratory and, and we're doing testing, we greatly preferred doing the MCR recovery rather than having the ductility bath, having to stretch the specimen and do all those sorts of things. That was a, a pain in the backside. And so uh, we, were, we were definitely in favor of doing that. It was just a much more practical. And as it turns out uh, from the research that we've seen, it seems to be a more effective way of characterizing modified binders as well. Well, I mentioned modified binders, and from the Association of Modified Asphalt Producers, uh, we can see uh, a list of different ways of modifying. Before I go any further, let me stop and see if there's any questions that you've collected thus far, Larry. Is there anything? No, uh, no questions so far. Everybody's listening attentively, so uh, we'll just continue on. I'll it. keep monitoring. Excuse me, y'all, but we actually do have yeah. a few questions. Let me uh, just put them in the chat box for you real quick. Hang on just one moment. Oh, okay. And nothing showed up on my part. I'll just wait until you tell me something. Anyway, just this is the association. Of yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and talk about this page, and then I'll watch for these uh, questions okay. come through. Thank you, Gary. You all can read the list as well as I can, and you can see a variety of things. And this is probably not a, a all-inclusive list of anything and everything that's been used to quote modify and quote uh, asphalt binders but the members of AMAP uh, use these types of things or supply these types of materials for doing that and uh, the company I work for supplies the one that's on the top which is probably the most widely used modifier that we see which are styrene block copolymers or SBS block copolymers. And so we'll be getting into those in a bit of detail in the next few slides in the next few minutes. Got the All question? right, continue on, Gary. I'll, I'll stop you when those come through. Okay. All right. Well, I think most folks on the line have heard of polymer modified binders. I know they have if they've been listening so up thus far, but they probably were aware of those beforehand. And as I pointed out on the text dot slide, uh, there are Elasticity requirements that are applied to binders where people are wanting to specify those. And typically, you know, when you get above 90 degrees in that grade difference, that is, if you look at the absolute difference, 70 minus 22, for example, that difference would be 92 degrees. Whenever you have some uh, grades that have more than a 90 degree difference, it's very difficult to meet that criterion without modifying the binders. Not impossible, but difficult. Uh, 
in order to assure that you're getting polymer modified binders what many specifiers have done like stout has is to include an elastic recovery requirement or mstr recovery requirement in there, or simply state in the specification that you will use an sb or sbs modifier in order to achieve uh, specific grades uh, the florida department of transportation and georgia dot do something like that now what the sbs modifier does is it increases the high temperature grade of the material without affecting significantly the low temperature qualities, but will be more importantly, it does it by providing elasticity at high surface temperatures. And I have a video coming up that I'm going to show that will illustrate that visually to you. Ready for the questions? Yeah, they had, they had one question. Uh, does the, the guy was stating that uh, asphalt a long time ago, 30, 40 years ago, lasted a lot longer than it does now. Is this due to uh, what? What maybe could that be a possible cause? And I'll just let you kind of elaborate on that. Oh gosh, uh, that, it's kind of a broad stroke, you know. But yeah, I mean, you talk about the ultimate "it depends" answer. You know, one thing that's happened, uh, and I'll, I'll speak specifically to some parts of the state on this. But uh, right. if we go back 30, 40 years ago. Um, there was no such thing as NAFTA. There was no such thing as hydraulic fracturing. And what's happened really in over those years is you've seen a dramatic increase in truck traffic that's going on to pavement and on materials that were never designed for anything like that. Exactly. That's not the be all and end all answer, but that's a significant thing. And if you look at the United States and the truck traffic, I mean, and with the with NAFTA, the funnel comes right down through Texas, you know, more yep. so than anywhere else. And so with that, and then when you add on top of that, the, the changes in the oil field, and that's especially in the last 10 years, that's one explanation, but it's certainly not the only one. No, I did. like I said, the truck traffic and the NAFTA agreement allows those trucks to come across the border in any way they want to be. So we did have some failures due to overload trucks, which you know can, can happen. But uh, I think with the new polymer modified asphalt binders, we're just having some great success. And uh, it, it, we're just upgrading, you know, as new technology comes around just to make everything better and better, you know. Another thing, you know, I mentioned before that according to EIA statistics, there's only four refiners in the state that's producing asphalt these days. Um, you go back then and there were a lot more of them. And so I don't know exactly what that means in terms of, of, of how that translates into pavement performance. But uh, what, what you were seeing then were some different binders than what we're seeing right now, just because uh, some of the sources or many of the sources that existed back at that time aren't around anymore. Exactly, exactly. And crew right, slates have changed as well. Sounds good. All right. We'll keep going then. All right. Well, polymer. And that comes from the Greek term, uh, uh, mare means part, poly means many, and so that means many parts. And so what this is is a, 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 a it's chemicals that are attached to each other form a different molecule, a new molecule, molecule that has its own characteristics. Uh, polymers occur in nature. You know, when, uh, when you look at starch, what that is is polymerized sugars. You know, they're being glued together or connected chemically with each other uh, in a way that gives, that has those characteristics. If you look at, at, um, at uh, cellulose, uh, and on the far right there, you see some, uh, trees. Well, that's wood. Cellulose is a natural polymer as well, which is a different combination of those things. They're linked together differently, but they have very similar building blocks as starch would have. Uh, you see natural rubber used, uh, which was probably one of the first modifiers used like that that comes out of trees. And then, um, and then uh, latex, uh, which is also coming from that, or can be, there's uh, synthetic latex as well. So there's a wide variety of different polymers that are used in every that are naturally occurring and that help make up who we are as well uh, and and we see and deal with in everyday life now styrene block copolymers are those that have been identified that are specifically useful for modifying asphalt polymers 
And uh, this came about really in the late 20th century, uh, where it was identified that besides using these types of materials for making things such as uh, athletic shoes or tennis shoes, as I would call them, uh, and other types of applications like that, what they find is that the combination of qualities here that are by the monomers, which are the building blocks for polymer, this is the polystyrene and polybutadiene, provide characteristics that can enhance the physical qualities of asphalt binders. Polybutadiene is the rubbery type substance in there. That TG, that's a glass transition temperature. That number is uh, minus 90 degrees Celsius. For polystyrene, which are the hard components in there, uh, the glass transition on that is over the is higher than the boiling point of water. And so what you can do with these things is they're not all the same. You can you can design these polymers to have different physical characteristics uh, that can also be used with asphalt to provide enhancement to the physical qualities that affect performance. This is a video, and I'll just be quiet so that you can watch. I'll narrate a little bit. But what the fellow is doing is pouring a little brick, you could say, of an unmodified asphalt binder like a PG-64-22. And as you can see, as they stretch it, they're able to get it to move and get it to move, and it's not really doing anything. It's just stretched out and not coming back. Now, I'm going to try to forward this thing a little bit to, because the rest of this is just showing how you put this together in the laboratory. And you can find this on YouTube if you want. So if you want to look at all the rest of it, you can. But the point that I want to get to here is let's look what happens when there's a polymer modified material. And he's getting ready to pour up another specimen, the same type of specimen with an SBS modified binder, letting it cool out of the form first thing that you notice is this is a lot harder for the same person to pull apart and you can't stretch it out to as thin and now watch this what it's going to do is it's going to come back and recover its shape that's the elasticity quality that you're trying to measure with uh, elastic recovery or mscr recovery and it's that benefit there along with the adhesive imp quality improvements and so on and just the overall strength improvement to provide the benefits that SBS modification give to asphalt binders and to asphalt pavement performance. There's a variety of factors in the formulation. I mentioned there's differences in SBS that can be designed and the architecture can be different and result in different polymer sizes or molecular weights that work better with different asphalt binders. Again, asphalt binders are not all the same by any means chemically. And so those that chemical composition in combination with the polymer architecture are the primary things that affect the formulation. Can you cross-link them or connect them once they're in place is another thing, and there's a variety of ways of doing that uh, during the production of the polymer modified asphalt binder. And then details during processing, such as the equipment, temperature, vegetation, the amount of time used, uh, affect the, the formulation of the polymer modified asphalt. Uh, different types of styrene butadiene copolymers exist, I've been talking mostly about the two on the bottom there, that is SBS and then uh, the, and then radial SBS, but there's styrene butadiene and there's SBR latex, which is a random orientation of uh, styrene, polystyrene and polybutadiene. What we make at Craton is the SBS uh, co block copolymers. And there are several varieties. This comes from our website and you can see uh, small ones intermediate sized ones and bigger ones. And the one that a supplier would use for modifying a particular asphalt is going to depend clearly on the specifications, but also on the base asphalt that they're using. And so this is something that they consider and look into. Uh, and that's something that uh, as a company, our research center is, is there to help our customers formulate these things and to identify what the best solution is for them to reach the desired result uh, in order to comply with the specifications and ultimately to provide improved payment performance. Uh, not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but uh, just the process of being of making SPS. Uh, you saw a glimpse of what you do in the laboratory. This is pulling it up to, to industrial scale uh, where you would have uh, a high shear mill involved, which will help break the polymer particles down to smaller ones that can be more rapid be uh, incorporated into the asphalt binder or can absorb portions of that asphalt binder more quickly and more thoroughly and then uh, op opportunity to store 
during blend to where you get the time and temperature effect, and then off to the rack to where it can be uh, delivered to projects. The performance of polymer modified asphalt, I've hinted about that before, but that's been detailed uh, by uh, a research study that was performed by the Asphalt Institute or, or for the Asphalt Institute and for the Association of Modified Asphalt Producers. Uh, this work was done by Applied Research Associates. If you know Harold Von Quinnis, he was the lead uh, person that was doing that. He lives in Round Rock, by the way. Uh, at any rate, what they were doing were using, they were uh, taking the same, a similar approach that they were doing in development of the ASHTO Mechanistic Empirical Design Guide, which was take test sections and then they would look at the performance of those test sections to develop transfer functions between response models or response under load to uh, distress types and pavements. What they did is they took that same approach they were able to identify a number of paired sites to where you had it. the only variable was polymer modified versus unmodified asphalt binders around the United States. And so they went out and evaluated those sites, used that same process to develop uh, transfer functions for unmodified materials and for modified. So that they could there could be a side-by-side -side comparison on that. Uh, that information that, or this is summarized and detailed in the two publications that you see there that are both available through the Asphalt Institute website. The findings on this, if you look at these dots, each dot represents a pair of test sections. And so on the one on the upper left, and let's just pick uh, this one right here. What that did is on that particular, on that side, on that pair of test sections, the rut depth that was measured on the unmodified asphalt binder, and I don't know if you can see the arrow here, is around 1.6 inches. For the modified, on the polymer modified, it was less than half an inch. And what you can see on here, and these are lines of equality for each of these stress. This is fatigue cracking here. This is transverse or thermal cracking here, is that there was clearly a lot more distress on the unmodified asphalt than on the modified asphalt binder. Uh, what they ultimately developed on this was they developed a damage index and so they were able to come up with that for conventional mixes and polymer modified mixes. Again, these are for paired sections that they're looking at, so it enables a direct comparison. And what you see here is about a 50% improvement in the anticipated life. So if you're looking for ways for enhancing the life of, of, of asphalt pavements, this is clearly one way of doing it. This is why uh, we've seen polymer modified binders Become so much more popular in recent years. Uh, there's some states that are using only polymer modified asphalt in state DOT projects. Uh, and some of these are up in the northern part of the country. But, uh, to give you an example that's probably more related to Texas in Florida, the Florida Department of Transportation is now using about, it's over half of the asphalt paving mixes that they specify require the use of polymer modified asphalt. And so uh, you can see that it's not just something that applies to Vermont or to Alaska, it applies to southern climates as well. And I think that's something that we can uh, derive some uh, good information from. Questions always come up about economics. And so probably the best way to compare this is where you can get an apples to apples comparison is to just simply look at, um, at things like a cost index. Uh, TxDOT doesn't maintain a, a cost index for us providers, but Oklahoma and Louisiana does. And the nice thing about the Louisiana DOTD index is that, uh, for one thing, they have some common suppliers with TechDOT, but also they have different indices for different binder grades. So they have ones for 64 minus 22 and polymer modified grades. So if we look at their index, and you can see that you can easily get that from their website, the difference in the binder cost between 76 minus 22, which is the most common polymer modified grade specified, and PG 64 minus 22, was $134 a liquid ton. What does that translate into, into mixture cost? If you look at or assume 5% asphalt binder, that means about 68 cents per square yard for a two inch material. And when you put that in perspective, looking at the performance benefits that we talked about, and you start thinking about the overall cost of the project in terms of pavement markings, uh, traffic control, large projects, if you have bridges, earthwork, that sort of thing, this is almost, or this is practically invisible. And yet what you're able to buy with this is something substantial if you're able to cut down the amount of time it takes you have to take in order to go out there and repair equipment or, or reduce the number of activities you have. And that is fundamentally why you've seen the increase in the use of polymer modified asphalts in recent years in the US. 
Now, where are things going from here? Uh, looking at what happens in an asphalt to polymer, we mentioned that you could almost call it digestion sort of thing. At any rate, you have two phases that are within the binder. You have a asphalt binder, asphalt phase or bitumen phase, as it's called here. And the polymer will actually absorb part of the chemical component of the asphalt binder in there and swell up. So that's why you see this depiction here. There's 2%, 2.5% by weight, but the volume winds up being higher than that after everything is all said and done. When you looking at this here on the right hand side, you can see what looks like little stars or little blocks of polymer that are suspended in the, as in the asphalt binder. But down here, you've got little balls of asphalt binder suspended in the polymer to where the polymer is really controlling the entire response uh, mechanism of that binder. So it winds up being, instead of a polymer modified here, it's an asphalt extended polymer as you have down here. And if you look at what that does or the effect of that on qualities of the asphalt binder, and ev not every asphalt binder is going to respond exactly the same way, but generally speaking, if you look at a characteristic like softening point, or if you looked at G star over sine delta or J and R or uh, percent recovery, you could see a, a, a graphic like this, which we call an S curve, uh, just obviously due to its shape to where you have an area where there's a rapid change in qualities and then it levels off up here at the top. When you get up to seven and a half percent and higher on this, you wind up having a, a stable amount of material in terms of the effect of the so on things such as softening point. And again, you're at that phase there to where it's the polymer that's completely in control of the response. Since this is a much tougher material and it's an elastic material, you would expect to have better performance from this. And what that's led to is what we call highly modified asphalts or high performance grade asphalt binders as we're introducing or trying to introduce here into Texas now. In this case, you're looking at something on the order of around 7.5%, which is usually more than double the amount of SPS polymer used to make grades such as 76 minus 22. But what's most importantly, and we'll get into detail on this during the next program, the level of benefit you get from this is perhaps greater than you get, than you get going from 64 minus 22 to 76 minus 22. You develop that continuous network, and therefore you re reduce the sensitivity to temperature changes, you impart much greater resistance to rutting, rutting and cracking. And uh, you can actually do this while handling materials at temperature similar to 76 minus 22. I mentioned those pictures before. This one the left was taken in 2013. This is uh, in Manhattan on First Avenue. And what they anticipate there is uh, typically having to remove and replace the surface every two years. The original pavement here was a 17 inch thick jointed reinforced concrete pavement that uh, the utility companies and traffic had ravaged over the years. What they did is they went in and did localized patching and repairs. Uh, they came in and milled that surface down to get a uniform texture and, and so on. They applied a very heavy tack coat with 76 minus 22, and then they resurfaced that with one and a half inches of asphalt in 2013. 2019, it's still there and still performing well. Now, utility companies haven't stopped. They went back in there and they've done some things and done some patching as well. But where they haven't gone in, that surface remains intact and in very good condition, according to the New York City DOT. Uh, what they did on that is they borrowed the New Jersey performance then overlay specification, which is, uh, I see I left out a quotation mark there, but, um, which is very similar in concept to the text.tom mixtures or thin overlay mixtures. But what they have on this are very, very strict performance-related criteria that are, uh, that are it's, and it's really probably the first uh, broad application of a balanced mixed design concept in the United States. And when I say broad application, last year, over 19% of the mixture tonnage that New York, New Jersey DOT let incorporated this type of mixture, which was the most of any binder of, of any mixture specification that they had. At any rate, in New York City, they use that spec to apply this over that past joint concrete pavement, and it's still in good shape now, six years later, when typically it's replaced on the two-year cycle. Now, that's not the only example I can give, but I think that's one that probably gets a lot of people's attention because of the types of traffic, 
Also, the demands of trying to repair an existing street and rehabilitate what's there, and just being able to hold up to the demands that you have in that case. We'll go back in a bit more detail over that part two, as well as going into storage and handling of polymer modified bath binders and how you sample them, and uh, discuss asphalt binder grade selection in a bit more detail there. Any other questions? No, I don't see anything right now. So uh, if you do have some questions, there's Gary's phone number. Also, you can call into the Texapa location, uh, ask your question, and they will contact me and I can get with Gary, whichever way we'd like to do it. Gary, we want to appreciate you being with us this morning. Again, we had a little bit of volume problem on, on uh, maybe Gary's end, but we'll have that adjusted next time. But we could all hear it and understand what's going on. So we've got a good uh, webinar here. So uh, just want to thank you so much and look forward to seeing you next month. And y'all tune in for our webinars. Again, go to our website, visit that, sign up for the MAPS conference early. If you'd like to have a uh, exhibit there at one of our tables, there's a place where you can uh, uh, sign up for one of the tables or contact Emily here at the office. Again, thank you, Gary. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And you ha you see my name and phone number and email address. Don't hesitate to call me if I can be of any help. Sounds good. And we'll be signing off at this point. Thank you all very much and look forward to seeing you next next month. Thank you.